Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's um, wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, my name is Chris Bige. I'm the Rotman Faculty Fellow in Philosophy and Neuroscience. And this is a position that was made possible by a generous donation by Joseph Rotman to the Rotman Institute from the Rotman Family Foundation. And it was matched by the university. And it's given us the opportunity um, uh, to do a few things. Uh, primarily, it's for connecting um, the institutes, the Rotman Institute and the Brain and Mind Institute. And part of um, uh, the package was to uh, start a series in philosophy and neuroscience. Um, and today's event is the uh, inaugural event uh, in that series. Um, and uh, of course, we're thrilled to have uh, Patricia Churchill as our speaker. So I'm going to invite uh, Mel Goodale to uh, introduce our speaker. And then um, we'll leave it to Patricia Churchill to take it from there. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm Mel Goodale. I'm the director of the Brain and Mind Institute. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm really delighted to introduce Professor Patricia Churchland as the inaugural speaker in our new Philosophy of Neuroscience lecture series. I really think there's no better person to kick off the series than Pat Churchland, um, who's not only one of the world's best known philosophers of science, but is the founder of a scholarly enterprise uh, known as Neurophilosophy the application of uh, neuroscientific principles to traditional philosophical questions. In fact, Pat uh, literally wrote the book uh, on neurophilosophy, uh, a book entitled, uh, as you might expect, uh, Neurophilosophy, uh, <laughs> Toward a Unified Science of Mind-Brain. Uh, Pat is a Canadian. Uh, she was born in uh, BC and was raised on a farm, uh, so Wikipedia tells me, uh, in the South uh, Okanagan Valley. And after completing her undergraduate training at uh, UBC, she was awarded uh, a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship to study uh, at Pittsburgh, University of Pittsburgh, where she completed her MA. And then she was off to Oxford as a British Council and Canada Council Fellow, where she was awarded to be filled. Now, Pat's, uh, she came back to Canada. Pat's first academic appointment uh, was at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. Um, but in the mid-'80s, uh, she and her husband Paul moved to the University of California at San Diego, uh, where they've remained ever since. The weather's there. Uh, weather there is uh, quite good, I understand. <laughs> Better than, uh, than perhaps the center of Winnipeg. For... <laughs> Pat also holds uh, a position at the Salk Institute, uh, where she collaborated with uh, Terry Sanofsky uh, and, and the late Professor Francis Crick. Now, when, uh, when Pat published Neurophilosophy in 1986, uh, which set up the arguments about why philosophers have to pay attention to neuroscience um, and incorporate the findings of neuroscience uh, into their philosophy. I, I think it's fair to say that this pioneering and, and prescient view was not, uh, was not universally accepted. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. In fact, uh, she herself has commented uh, that many philosophers at the time thought uh, that she was out to lunch. Uh, it was just too radical for its time. But, uh, of course, now neurophilosophy is ascendant, and even her former critics acknowledge that she was ahead of the curve. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Patricia Churchland, who will be talking to us about uh, the brains behind morality, which is a theme based on her latest book entitled Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality. I'm on. I think I'm on. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, the opportunity to give a talk this afternoon. Um, it's really always a great pleasure uh, to come back home, even though actually Ontario is a long way from British Columbia, but it still does feel like home when you cross that border. Um, and it's also a very special pleasure to be at Western Ontario. The connections uh, between the work that Paul and I did and to the work that was being done in the philosophy of science here at Western Ontario go a long, long way back. And uh, so I, I feel a, a real connection, a very special connection uh, with Western Ontario. And it's also a really special delight to see the Rotman Institute coming into being 
And to see the Mind Brain Institute flourishing and undertaking these extraordinary projects that uh, really make you feel that neuroscience is the most exciting thing in the world. Now, um, today I want to say a little bit about uh, morality, um, but not a lot. Uh, that is to say, there is much to say about it, but I'm really going to confine myself um, to talking about where values come from and hence what about brain evolution made it possible to have social values in general and to have moral values in particular. And um, as Mel Goodell said, the talk is really a kind of praise of the ideas uh, in my last book, um, Brain Trust, which was published uh, in 2011 by Princeton University Press. Okay, so in thinking about value of any kind, we can see that for any organism, it must be organized, that is, its nervous system must be organized to maintain the well-being of that organism at least long enough for the organism to reproduce. So any organism whose nervous system does not care about survival and maintenance of the self will not long survive. And so from the very beginning, we see that there is um, as it were, an organized drive on the part of the nervous system to maintain the well-being of the organism. And so there's kind of a sort of, as you might think, uh, self-centeredness to this. It's me and my survival, my well-being, my food, my warmth, my safety. And so this has provoked many people, especially within neurobiology, and especially if they haven't paid too much attention to the evolution of the brain, um, to think that the emergence of social values, and in particular of moral values, is somehow inconsistent with biology. That the self-orientation, the uh, competition with others for my own survival, is somehow going to be incompatible with the development of social values. And hence it has seen uh, to people like Richard Dawkins that you can't expect to find in biology any rationale for social values. Interestingly, Darwin saw it differently. And Darwin, of course, was very interested in the fact that many species of animal, particularly mammals, but not only mammals, are intensely social. And he wondered what the rationale or the final motivation uh, for that could be. And in The Descent of Man, he raised that question. And he thought, as actually Aristotle before him and David Hume before him had also thought, and that is that there must be social instincts, an instinct that motivates the animal to want to be with others and to enjoy being with others, and to feel displeasure or to feel pain when separated and isolated. So there must be social instincts of at least that minimal sort. In addition, like Hume and Aristotle, Darwin realized that uh, in the case of mammals, there would be the acquisition of certain kinds of habits mediated undoubtedly by the reward system to make certain kinds of behavior more probable, behavior that conformed to the practices of the group. And uh, finally, he thought that reason played a role, although needless to say, Darwin didn't really know how to characterize reason, as indeed we do not now know how to characterize reason. Except that I think probably what we might now say is that problem solving even of a minimal sort that we can see in social rodents, but also what we see in large-brained mammals like primates uh, and humans, that that also plays a role. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that, but really it's the first two that I'm most interested in. Now in this slide, I really just want to remind you of uh, what we've learned from uh, anthropologists about um, the origin of humans. So on the vertical, oh, that's me scratching, sorry. Uh, on the vertical axis, uh, we have years, years uh, in uh, millions, 
and spatial extent on the horizontal axis. And it's worth realizing, of course, that Homo sapiens have been around for about a quarter of a million years. And that's important because for a number of reasons, one of which is that sometimes when we ask the question, where do values come from, a very natural answer is it comes from religion. And yet, it's extremely unlike from everything that we know about even existing hunter-gatherer groups that humans had anything like organized religion or organized sets of rules for at least the first 220,000 years they were on the planet, which is a long time. So bear in mind that agriculture really only got going about 10,000 years ago, which meant that you really only began to see large towns and settlements about 10,000 years ago. And that writing and reading, consequently, are only about 5,000 years. And so it's important to see that when we think that religion is maybe the font of all values, that that's unlikely to explain the very effective social behavior that must have existed in human groups for about a quarter of a million years. And we know that even for existing uh, hunter-gatherer groups, or those who have been studied uh, before they were, so to speak, uh, civilized, um, that by and large we there too do not see much in the way of organized religion, at least by which I mean it's not like uh, the, the three Middle Eastern religions, for example. The other thing that I think is interesting about this is here is Homo erectus. So Homo erectus lived on the planet for a very long time, was very successful. Now here's what I think is cool about Homo erectus. They had brains of about 800 to 1,000 cc's. Yours is between 1,300 and 1,500 cc's. So a lot smaller. They did very well. They were upright. They had teeth much like ours. Not only that, but look at their spatial extent. They actually built rafts and got themselves to Indonesia, which takes a certain amount of cooperation which bespeaks quite a lot in the way of social organization and that social values. Okay, the other kind of background point that I think is, is important um, to take out of biology is that there are, of course, many, many social species. And sometimes people look at the really magnificent social species that are, uh, for example, bees, and think, well, you know, are we just kind of fancy, whipped up bees? And the answer is almost certainly not, that the sociality that we see emerging in mammals is very different and followed almost certainly a very different evolutionary course. Um, and I'll, of course, go into that a little bit more. And I just thought these guys are quite cute. They're discus fish. Uh, it's the male and the female. And once the female lays the eggs, one of the things that they do is feed the babies. And so you can see the babies on the outside of the um, skin. And what the babies are doing is eating a bit of the protein that is exuded through the skin. And you might think, oh, man, you know, that's pretty much like, you know, having mammary glands and so on. It's not. So bear in mind that when we see that there is sociality, that it need not look the same across all species. And I think mammals are very different, and they're very different for very interesting reasons, having to do with this amazing new structure that came with mammals, and that is cortex. And so in the case of mammals, we see a relationship between parents and offspring that is really unique. Now, um, one other background point before I sort of really get into the business of the mammalian brain and what's so special about it. Uh, at this point, it's not unreasonable to say, well, what do you actually mean by morality? And my answer is going to be slightly roundabout, for which I apologize, but there just isn't any other way uh, to do this. So, most of our concepts and categories, the ones that get us around the planet on a day-to-day -day basis, 
have, as I'm sure you know, what's known as a radial structure, by which I mean they have prototypes at the center, which are examples of the category that we all pretty much agree on. They have fuzzy, not sharp, boundaries. And between the prototypes and the fuzzy boundaries, there is with decreasing levels of similarity to the prototype. And so, as we know, in Western undergraduate classes, if you ask what's the first vegetable that comes to your mind, most people, like 90% of people, will say a carrot. Now, this is not necessarily true in the Inuit schools in the north, for example. Uh, what about a radish? Well, many fewer think of those as vegetables. What about chanterelle mushrooms that you find wild in the wood? They're in the fuzzy boundary like parsley is also in the fuzzy boundaries. Now, here's the interesting thing about the, about the radial structure of categories, and that is often there is no right answer to whether or not parsley is legally a vegetable. And I actually never lose sleep at night wondering whether really parsley is a vegetable. And that's because there is no right now, of course, sometimes in the context of the law, we are forced to make an answer, but that's a different issue, uh, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, the other, the other important point, then, is that you will get cultural variability in what constitutes uh, the prototype. So if you think of a dwelling in Texas, that might be the prototype. And for the Inuit, it's that. Paul's mother was born in one of those. My house on, in Oliver was a little bit bigger than this and had some windows, but otherwise it was pretty much like that, and so forth. And this is relevant because with moral concepts like friend or honest, truthful, trustworthy, I think they too are radio concepts. And you're going to see cultural variability. So for example, the Inu for the Inuit, the very worst of the sins, of the social sins, was not, as it might be for us, murder. It was deceit. And there, that was for a very good reason, because deceit could imperil the whole group. And of course, they lived on the knife edge of survival. Whereas murder was usually confined to one guy killing another guy over a wife. Uh, and you could stop the spread of the violence, and that would be the end of it. So I also think that, in general, the concept of moral and not moral are best not defined by philosophers who want to get necessary and sufficient conditions, but to recognize the utility of these categories in everyday use, where we can agree on, roughly speaking, what the prototypical cases are, what the boundary cases are, and we may not agree on how to deal with certain cases, whether they, it really is immoral or whether it really is not, and moreover, we may change our mind uh, over time. So those are the background points that I want to make. And I want now to go to the main hypothesis that is of interest to me, and that is that sociability, wanting to be together, liking to be together, and caring for others, caring about what happens to them, uh, is a basic value for social mammals, whether they are rodents, or bonobos, or chimpanzees, or humans. And that the hub of the story is this actually very ancient molecule, peptide, oxytocin, and its sibling peptide, vasopressin. We call it a sibling peptide because they probably had a common origin. They're very simple peptides that differ uh, in only two amino acids. That's the hub of the story. It's augmented by the reward system, by the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, and so forth, that are extremely important in allowing the animal to feel pleasure under certain conditions and pain under others. Pleasure when it does something that is approved of, pain on condi under conditions where it is not approved. And that's where the habits that so interested Hume and interested Darwin um, are rooted. And finally, that sociability gets elaborated with the elaboration of the cortex. 
and I'll have a little bit more to say about uh, cortex. Now, I'm sure everybody here knows what the cortex is, but it's always useful to be reminded. So here we're looking at a coronal section, so we're cutting the brain this way, and it, the cortex refers only to this dark uh, gray stuff on the outside that kind of lies like a blanket uh, over the engine, <clears throat> which are the subcortical structures. And it's gray because it consists largely of cell bodies. And the other thing that's so interesting about the cortex is the way that it is so systematically and carefully organized. And cortex of that kind, six layers precisely organized with certain inputs always coming into layer four, certain outputs always going into layer five. Oh, that's that. Okay. <laughs> um, is new with mammals. So what do you see in reptiles? Well, they do, of course, have these uh, structures like hypothalamus, basal ganglia, and so forth. Don't they have a cortex? Doesn't an alligator have a cortex? And the answer is no. What they have is a kind of loose little rug of cells, maybe two layers, maybe one layer, that shows nothing of this highly systematic, highly regular organization that is absolutely unique to the cortex. So, what is so great about the cortex? And the answer is no one really knows. We know what the general upshot is of having a cortex, and that is animals with lots of it are smart, and they have a capacity for control. But we don't really know what it is about this structure uh, that allows that. But that's another, uh, another story. And, and again, I just want to remind you um, that, of course, rhesus monkey has a brain that is smaller than a chimpanzee and much smaller uh, than a human. So there's a crocodile with a little bit of forebrain, but it does not have neocortex. It does not have this six-layer, highly organized thing. A rat, however, certainly does. So where did cortex come from, and how can it be that cortex is part of the story of morality? Now, here I'm going to speculate a little bit, guided by uh, the evolutionary biologists. But sometime about 200 million years ago, warm-bloodedness appeared in certain animals, the sauropsids, which meant that they had a capacity to hunt at night and also to hunt in places uh, where it was cold. And that was very advantageous, because if you are a warm-blooded animal, and all these cold-blooded animals are lying around waiting for the sun to come up, it's dinner time. And so warm-bloodedness was highly advantageous. The disadvantage of being warm-blooded is that you have to eat a lot to keep yourself warm. So sort of ounce for ounce, a warm-blooded animal has to eat about 10 times as much as a cold-blooded animal. So that puts certain constraints on your reproductive behavior. In particular, notice that these cold-blooded guys can all do very well on a small patch because they eat relatively little. These guys eat a lot, and so there can be relatively few of them on a large patch. So what? Well, what that means is that if you're a mammal, or if, if you're a warm-blooded sauropsid, what you need to do is not have quite so many babies, have fewer babies, invest in them, and see that they do well. So we already begin to see, Mother Nature, that's me, uh, of a reason for reorganizing slightly the reproductive uh, behavior. Now, there's another thing that kicks in here, but because the evolution of cortex is completely not understood, we're going to speculate. But it does rather look like there was a trade-off between having lots of babies who are very independent, like little turtles and lizards, and having babies who are warm-blooded, you have few of them, and here's the great thing, they tune themselves up to the environment. They learn. 
Now, what's great about that is that it gives you flexibility. So if you're a lizard and you're born in a certain place, your brain is rigged out to survive in that place. If you're a mammal, you can be born somewhere, travel somewhere else, travel somewhere else, and your brain will tune itself up to that particular environment. So those people who study the evolution of the nervous system think that warm-bloodedness and the capacity to have flexibility in learning are very closely tied. Now this is also, I'm sure, a familiar slide, but if you look at cortex of a mammal at approximately, I think this is a human actually, one month, you can see there are lots of cells, but they don't have many axons, and their dendritic trees are rather sparse. By the time they're four years, there's a huge amount of growth. And that all takes a gene expression and a lot of food, but it gives you a certain kind of capacity, the capacity to be smart. And sometimes that means to adapt to a new area. Sometimes it also means to be a really good predator. And so we think that these are the sort of elements um, that fed into the story. Now, so how does oxytocin and vasopressin, which I said were the hub of the story of the changes in the mammalian brain that make sociality possible? What's the story with them? And the answer seems to be roughly like this. If you're a mother turtle, you are, your nervous system is organized to care about your food, your warmth, and your safety. Yours. But if you're a mammal, one of the, a very interesting thing has happened, and that is that from all of that knee caring expands to me and mine. It's as though the very same circuitry is modified, expanded, changed, so that in effect, the offspring are part of me. And so I care about their food, warmth, and safety in much the same way as I care about my own. Now, of course, they aren't just me. And so uh, other little changes had to be made, too. So for example, if uh, you are at a rodent nest and a pup is removed from the nest, the pup squeals. That causes pain in the mom, and she scrambles like mad to get the pup back, back in. Now, this is biology, as Darwin rightly saw. But notice what it is. It's the extension of caring for me to caring for me and mine. And so we have this huge change in behavior that makes mammalian sociality possible, and which turns out to be very advantageous. So it's advantageous in the first analysis because of the need for caring for dependent offspring. But it also turns out to be advantageous, as many mammals discover, because living in groups provides protection. Now, I said that oxytocin is at the hub of the story. Oxytocin is secreted in uh, the hypothalamus. And um, it's secreted both in the male and in the female, but oxytocin is more abundant in females than in males. Vasopressin, which is extremely important for the protection of the offspring against intruders, so it enables the males and the females, actually, um, to fight off a threat. Um, those are very important parts of the story, but because it's sometimes easy to simplify and think that oxytocin is the moral molecule, which it manifestly is not, I just wanted to put up this slide by, David, by Don Pfaff, showing that, of course, um, there are many other hormones and uh, neuromodulators involved, but of course there's also circuitry that is involved. So here's kind of where I'm, I'm getting to. So social urges involve pleasure, the pleasure of being together. And, and those parts of the brain that regulate pleasure are active in those circumstances. And, they, and pain is felt by social isolation. And that's why ostracism and disapproval work so well, not just on your kids, uh, but on dogs and on rodents and other things. Um, but now, of course, 
we kind of want to know, well, we understand how you can get from me to me and mine, simply to where mine are kind of an extension of myself. But that doesn't really quite get us to real morality. And so the intervening step, um, I mean, there's still much that's not understood, of course, but the intervening step that caught my attention depends on the social behavior of these little guys, the prairie voles. And as you can see, they are rodents. Um, and there is one of the voles hovering over uh, the babies. So many of you will know the story of the prairie voles and the montane voles, but lest you don't, uh, let me tell you the story. So montane voles are more or less what you would expect of a rodent. Male comes along, female comes along, they meet, they mate, they go their separate ways. She has babies, he goes and finds another maid, and so forth. All right? We think of rodents. We're not disrespectful, but we think that that's how they behave. Prairie voles are interestingly different, and Sue Carter and a couple of other people were the ones who noticed this. Okay, male comes along, female comes along, they meet, they mate, they are bonded forever. They are bonded for life. What does that mean? It means that they like to stay together. They're very distressed if they're separated. It means that the male guards the nest against intruders. Uh, it means that the male actually partakes in rearing the pups. When they go outside, when they first go outside and they're vulnerable, he'll hover over them and so forth. This is nothing like what we see in Monty. So they're very sociable. And uh, not only that, but they, they live in these large communities. And um, the siblings, say the first litter, will help with the rearing of the pups as well. So this is very social behavior, very different from the Montane book. So Sue Carter said, these guys are so similar in every respect to Montane and Prairie Well, What's the difference in the brain? And after stumbling around for a while, a really important difference, and we don't know whether it's the whole difference or just a major contributor, a, a big part of the story was found. So what you're looking at here is the brains of montane voles and prairie voles, and you're looking at cross-section. And the cross-section will take you through the subcortical structures which are involved in reward. Now, this is the montane vole, the prairie vole. This says oxytocin receptor. So, of course, for oxytocin or any other modulator to have an effect, it has to fit onto a receptor on the neuron, and then it affects the responsivity of that neuron. So, the receptors are very important. You could have tons of uh, oxytocin sloshing around in your brain, but if you don't have the receptors, it won't do you any good. And this says vasopressin receptor. Okay, so here are the differences that were finally unraveled. In the prairie bowl, in the reward structure known as the nucleus accumbens, a very high density, it's stained black, of receptors for oxytocin. Very sparse density in the case of the montane bowl. In the case of the uh, vasopressin, uh, sorry, vasopressin receptors, in another part of the reward system known as the ventral pallidum, a very high density of receptors in the prairie bowl and not in the montane bowl. Well, you should be properly skeptical and say, well, that's a correlation. How do we know that there's causation? And that's the right question. And so they went ahead and did all the manipulations that you would imagine. The first thing that you do is you take a naive uh, male prairie vole and, and female prairie vole and you put in oxytocin blockers. They meet, they mate, they don't care. So you can completely uh, cut off this long-term bonding that is seen always after the first mate uh, just by that manipulation. To do the genetic manipulations, that is to take a montane vole, put in the gene for making receptors for oxytocin is tricky. You have to do it in the mouse, uh, you know, because that's where we know the genetics. Uh, suffice it to say it was done in the mouse and you can take very unsocial mice and make them social uh, just by putting in genes for the receptors for oxytocin. So this was a very striking result. Probably we need to know much more about the exact circuitry in the hypothalamus uh, that is important for this. 
but it was a very striking result. So this motivates the idea that attachment of the kind that we see between these prairie vole mates is a very important feature in adult sociality. It's an important feature that has to do with caring for others, not just for offspring. And that moreover, it may be the sort of thing that can be tweaked in minor ways, not necessarily genetically, but perhaps just by changes in the environment, so that caring extends beyond mates to others, to kin, to friends, and so forth. And so it seemed on the basis of um, this sort of development, that attachment and trust, as regulated in the ways that we saw in the prairie vole, may be what I call the platform for moral values. Now that doesn't mean it's, it's the be all and the end all. It's in a certain sense what enables the possibility, what enables social behavior to emerge. <coughs> they are then attachment and trust. They are sort of, if, if you like to talk in face-to-face -face terms, they are the dispositions that give shape and contour uh, to the problem space. And they are really the motivation, and we see this in large-brained animals, uh, mammals. Uh, they are the motivation to find good solutions to practical problems. So what would, the argument then is uh, we start off with organisms that are essentially wired to care only for themselves, and then wired to care for an extension of themselves, and then wired to care for kin and kiss, by which I mean mates, friends, and so forth. Now, there are many species, um, upwards of 5,000 species of mammals, and of course they will have evolved in rather different ecological conditions. They will have evolved rather different equipment, and so we see rather different developments um, of sociality. Now one question you will want to ask is, okay, it's very nice to know that oxytocin is secreted in the hypothalamus. Um, what exactly does it do to mediate something like trust behavior, or to mediate uh, attachment? And part of what we think that it does is that it downregulates anxiety, it downregulates the stress response. So normally, <coughs> if you're in, uh, an animal and a strange animal enters the compound, you will be aware, alert, vigilant, careful, anxious. Oxytocin seems to, to downregulate those kinds of responses. And so it acts on um, that part of the amygdala that is responsible for regulating fear responses. It downregulates that. It also downregulates uh, that part of the brainstem that has to do with uh, the sympathetic response. And so, to a first approximation, this is not quite correct, but to a first approximation, there's kind of a trade-off between rising levels of oxytocin and lowering levels of cortisol. And so you're, when your stress levels go down, what happens? You feel good. Nobody, I mean, you're, we're designed to not feel good when we're stressed and to find ways of countering that stress so that we can get back to feeling normal. So when oxytocin levels go up, you grew in me, my oxytocin levels are up, I feel good. I also feel, and I think we can now begin to see this in rodents as well as in large brain mammals, it also kind of sets the stage for cooperation. And certain kinds of cooperation may be so sort of encouraged, let me say, by the genes, but certain other kinds of cooperation probably just naturally come as a result of the, the social conditions of trust um, and attachment. Okay. Um, I also just wanted to, to make the quick point that with large brain mammals, social problem solving probably gets very much more sophisticated. Although, as we were talking at lunch, I'm guessing that for at least the first 230,000 years of human existence, social problems were probably pretty simple. 
You know, I mean, it didn't involve, you know, corruption of judges in the Supreme Court. Uh, you know, it didn't involve hanging chads or anything complicated like that. It was very simple. And so there probably was some great pressure on problem solving. But of course, given our big fat cortex, when social conditions change, and we live in these very socially complex environments with very interesting and complex institutions that structure and scaffold our lives, then of course, problem solving uh, is called upon um, to do its work. And of course, part of the story too is going to be the hippocampus and the importance of the hippocampus in remembering very particular events and who did what to whom and whether they are trustworthy or whether they lie, whether they cheat and so forth. A very useful kind of thing to have. Uh, okay, so I just want to say then to pick up the thread that uh, I put out earlier and that is that Different mammals are going to uh, evolve in, in very different ecological niches. Their social behavior will be constrained by their body equipment, as well as by their brain needs, as well as by their ecology. And so we see, for example, marmosets. They're tiny little New World monkeys, fit in the size of your hand, very clever little guys. They are like prairie bulls. They bond for life. The male takes care of the young. Often the males are really quite interesting in this regard. They're sort of very modern. Uh, they, they take care of each other's babies as well. And uh, so, you know, if one baby is in trouble and this guy is not really the dad, he'll go and help anyway. And so they're very interesting. And they, as I said, they bond for life. And they show that kind of sociality that um, suggests that they are uh, a little bit more like prairie wolves. Now, on the other hand, meerkats are really quite different. They're, they live on the Kalahari Desert. Um, there is only one breeding pair. If a female happens to get pregnant, she's likely to be killed by the uh, reigning female. But here's one of the things that they do that you know, lots of other ones don't, but after all, they live where there's a lot of lions. The males take turns being sentry looking for lions. Yeah, so he's putting himself slightly at risk. But there he is on top of the mound, uh, checking out. And if there are lions, he will signal and they'll all rush in. And I have to mention birds because they've been left out of the story, which is really unfortunate because most birds, bird species, are long-term pair bonders. And most species of birds have males that take a very active role uh, in caring to, uh, for the offspring. And uh, part of the reason that birds are not a more important part of the story, is that they separated, or at least the last common ancestor for birds and mammals is about 150 million years ago, and their brains are just quite different. We think they have, and I'll talk about this later if you're interested, we think they have an analog of something that is cortex, called the wolves, um, and, and that's why they can be so smart, and why they can remember things so well, and so show such control. But it's hard to study their brains because they look different. OK. Um, so I mentioned that depending on environment and equipment and so forth, uh, that uh, animals may be very social. I'm particularly interested in wolves, of course, because um, they, they are somewhat easier to study, and dogs are a little bit like them. But uh, they're such a wonderful example of how living in a group gives you tremendous advantages. Now, of course, this has been studied by ethologists. Um, and we know very clearly that a lone wolf or a lone coyote has a much shorter lifespan. They're scrounging around for rats while the other guys are feasting. Um, and, but this has also been shown to be true of baboons, uh, chimpanzees, and others. So if you're a loner, your life is apt to be tough. So in the case of wolves, uh, as you know, uh, they um, will call each other, they will come together, at, the pack will come together as a group in response to the call. Uh, the alpha male will mount everybody so everybody knows who's in charge, uh, and off they go. And so here you have a, a picture of cooperation that, that really makes the case for why living in groups is so great. So here's a grizzly. This is, of course, a Canadian picture. Um, 
<laughs> this is a grizzly who has brought down a moose. So, who are these? Well, these are the wolves that arrive on the scene, and the wolves, as you know, being good Canadians, the wolves will harass and harass and harass, and they will just drive them off eventually, and then they will tuck in. Very good strategy, works every time. And notice how they position themselves? Beautiful to watch. But look at this, who's this? <laughs> we'll go back to here. How do these guys know where to go? So the raven or the crow, as the case may be, can check out the woods in a moment and notice, knows where the kill is, alerts the wolves, flies with the wolves, so the wolves in their pack follow the, uh, the raven to the kill. So what's in it for the raven? Well, after they let the wolves have a good tuck in, the raven, he calls his buddies, they all come, and they harass and harass and harass the wolves, and they will drive them off. I don't know if you've ever been really close to a raven, Bill, but quite fortuitously, it happened to be this summer when the raven swooped down on the back of my dog, who had been bothering the babies, grabbed a chunk of fur and just tore it right off his back. And I had a close look at that bill, and I tell you, I would not want to be anywhere closer. And the wolves don't like it. And so it's a very interesting example of almost certainly not a cooperative behavior that emerges out of the genes, but one that these very smart animals um, found. Now, a couple of quick things on the downside of social life. I mean, we all know about sibling rivalry. Um, and we all know that uh, it has to be kept in social groups, it has to be kept uh, at a very low level. And so that's something that I haven't really addressed in the course of this, but it's certainly true both in, um, in human social groups, but also in other social groups, that not allowing too much in the way of uh, bad fighting behavior turns out to be very important. Now, we're sort of getting out of the area that I feel most comfortable in, and that's neurobiology, and into a cultural context. But the question has been raised about in-group bonding and out-group hostility, and certainly in-group bonding, and the, the, the tremendous fellow feeling that people within a group can have, and the hostility to others that they can have, uh, has been very well documented. It's also been suggested that this is genetic, so far, there's no evidence that it is. It could be, but we have to really kind of wait and see. Um, there's some reason to think that it, like writing, that it was a cultural invention. That um, the capacity for fighting, of course, is, is in mammals that are predators, and certainly humans are predators, and uh, killing other non-human mammals is a fairly nasty business, uh, and you do have to be sort of energetically up for it, and there is some reason to think that that is also pleasurable. But in the archaeological record on human interactions, uh, there's some evidence of, inter of between group conflict uh, that occurred about 100,000 years ago, but there isn't a lot, so it may well have been that by and large, it was not really in people's interest um, to fight the neighbors. I mean, what would you get? Well, they like to raid one another for women, and that makes sense, um, given consanguinity and so forth. Um, but what would you get? I mean, so, so think about it in the case of the Inuit, who really did not make war on each other. Um, I and mean, in all of the ancient out, or old anthropologists, Rasmussen and Boas and others, uh, made that observation. Well, first of all, going across the tundra, it's going to be hard not to be seen. Uh, and the dogs will bark. And what will you get when you get there? A new spear, maybe? There's not really much in it. So one line of reasoning is that outgroup hostility Group warfare is really a product of post-agriculture 
development, the development of large cities and, and large settlements, where it could be in someone's interest uh, to attack. Um, now, I don't want to say too much about the emergence of institutions, except to say that uh, in the post-agricultural period, of course, we did see the emergence of all kinds of institutions, including those that regulated trade, that were probably more basic uh, than um, any others. And there have been many people who have, and I just list a few here, who have addressed the issue of um, the, as cultural historians. And I think it's about this time uh, that we do see the emergence of organized religion. Because if you have groups where not everybody knows everybody else, and where my disapproval of your bad behavior uh, doesn't, because uh, I'm not there, uh, it can be a good idea to have, to, to instill in, and this must have occurred many, to many people in many cultures, you know, tell them that they're going to be seen anyhow, but not by a guy you can see. And, uh, and so I think that the kinds of gods that we see in, in Greek religions and others, and that then became refined, um, is, is, probably unrelated, is probably related to that. So this is my last slide. And uh, yes, it is a somewhat cheesy slide. Um, but it makes a point. And the point that I want to make is this that in the mammalian brain, there's room for lots and lots of slop. So that in the case of uh, honeybees, for example, it may be that you pretty much have to stick with what your genes designed your brain to do. But in the case of large-brained mammals, probably there is much more flexibility. So in this particular slide, what I'm showing you, of course, is an orangutan and a dog. Now, we were all trained to know that orangs are loners, right? They're arboreal, they uh, live in Borneo, and uh, they eat a lot of leaves, they're not predators, and so they're loners. And the mother, of course, will stay with uh, the baby until the baby is independent, and then he's expected to scuttle off. And so we think of them as not being social, and yet, so this was at a rescue center in Iowa. And so the orang had been there for a number of years. And then one day, the dog comes in. And the dog kind of looks around a little bit, looks around a bit, and then he finds the orang. And of course, they sniff each other, and they settle down. And they've been absolutely inseparable since. Now, part of the point of this is that when the resources are available, and you don't have huge pressure just to survive, then certain aspects of sociality will emerge in a very easy and comfortable and natural way. And so we see, we're seeing, now thanks to YouTube, we're seeing uh, additional instances of cross-species caring, where one, um, or one species will take the offspring of another. Interestingly enough, we also see, and this should not happen according to evolutionary biologists, but we see amongst chimpanzees a willingness to foster care infants that are in no way related to you. So Chris Bash has done this, made these observations in the Ngogo Reserve um, in Africa. And these, this is a very uh, sort of lush reserve, so there are huge uh, resource pressures. And in this particular instance, there were a number of females, five actually, who for one reason or another either died or were killed. And what he noticed was the males brought up the infants. And he has this wonderful videotape of the males teaching the, the infants how to crack nuts and so forth. Well, you might think, they're really the dads. Do the DNA and find out. <laughs> they did the DNA. They are not the dads. <laughs> Probably the dads have no idea who the dads are. In any case, that's not supposed to happen, right? You're not supposed to expend energy for something uh, that isn't going to rebound to your reproductive fitness. But I think in the case of large brain mammals, we see this, especially when times are good, when
and we were prosperous when there was uh, no huge resource pressures. We see these interesting kinds of behaviors emerge, uh, and they're wonderful to see. And I'd be happy, of course, to take questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your talk, which I appreciate very much. Thank you. I've always been struck by what I see as the analogy between looking in the brain for morality uh, as being analogous with the ancient practice of heresy. Of what? Heresy. Which is what Chinese. is that? So put it in. <laughs> the ancient Romans and Etruscans used to uh, have a practice of reading the entrails of animals oh, to I tell see. omens. And it's important to note that this practice is empirical. And so there are correlations were found between the liver, the, the way that the liver looks, and what ends up happening. Um, you mean whether there was a hurricane or not? Or what happens in war, whatever it is. Um, so it seems to me I've always been struck by the analogy of looking in the brain for morality. There, there's disanalogy there also. Um, Obviously, this practice is scientific in a much more rigorous way than Herodotus was. Um, but it seems like it's similarly the search for normativity in something like an organ um, seems to me very analogous. Um, and I'm wondering if you can highlight the ways in which that is not analogous, the ways in which that is important and different from this prior practice. I'll do my best. Um, did I mention the word normativity? Well, I'm assuming morality involves Well, it's complicated. So first of all, I think there are many parts to this story, and I think Darwin had that right. There are the social instincts, and that's really the main part of my story. That's what I mean by the platform. And the platform is all about that circuitry in the brain that enables sociality. And given sociality, that will enable the emergence in a very natural way of practices like truth-telling or like not, dis uh, uh, not murdering. Now, the other part of the story that Darwin had right is the importance of habits and how it is that via the reward system, children develop a conscience, a conscience about the kinds of things that are appropriate or inappropriate, about what's wrong and about what's right. Things that over time, and given the nature of the reward system, will seem absolutely true and inviolable. And the idea of sort of absolute moral rules, I think, comes out of that. And the reward system is very powerful in shaping our responses um, to these things. Now, the third part of the story has to do with what I think you might be interested in, and that is social problem solving. And so, under the, under the rubric of social problem solving might come such things as whether to make decisions by means of a group, or whether to do it by means of a leader and a king. And there, I think that it's like problem solving in any other context. Um, I think it's like solving a problem about relative to this set of conditions, what kind of boats should we build? Should we build kayaks? Ask the Inuit, <laughs> or over time, they modified their boats so they were kayaks. Or should we have these massive war canoes that the high do? And so I think that the domain of social problem solving is the domain that most people like to call uh, the domain of moral issues, where we ask questions about who should vote, whether a flat tax would be as fair as a graduated income tax, uh, whether there should be universal health care, and so forth. 
On those questions, I think it's a matter of judgment. And it's when people come together in the way that we know that they do. But I'm not a social historian. Those aren't the questions that I'm tracking. Is how did you know how did slavery come to be abolished in the U.S.? I know something about reading those things, but I'm not an expert. But I think we do know about where morality, that is, what the platform for morality is in mammals, in the mammalian brain. Um, and if that strikes you as being like looking at chicken entrails, I don't know what to say, except that we, you know, we have very good reason for thinking that these parts of the brain are important. So for example, if uh, you modify the nurturing behavior uh, of, of a mother rat um, so that you take the pups away, for example, and you make sure they're fed and all that sort of stuff, but they aren't licked, they are you know, cuddled and so forth, they have very different social behavior. Is that not the brain involved? It looks like it, especially when you do look at those brains and you find differences in density of receptors. Now, there is a way of approaching morality that sees it as coming out of pure reason where somehow philosophers have the capacity to access Plato's heaven. I am not one of those philosophers. I don't know where to go. I don't know where that is. And very little, at least in the 20th century, has come out of moral philosophy regarding uh, how to live a moral life, with one or two small exceptions. Um, that doesn't mean that <clears throat> what they say is not helpful, uh, but it does mean that if you're looking for it by hoping that pure reason will deliver the absolute truths from Plato's heaven, then I think that's worse than chicken entrails. <laughs> Several. I think I saw Angela next, then we're going to take one from uh, the online stream. This is kind of a follow up on Teresa's question. So I think what was lying behind the question is that you've given us a, a good story, I think, of moral cognition and behavior. Um, but I think what Lisa's worried about is what should I do? So sure. the moral question that I do, what I should do now. And uh, there's this idea that uh, these questions could be independent of my personal values. Maybe I care about you know, myself and my community, my media community, but um, it could be that the moral facts dictate that I should care also about people very far away that I happen not to care about, animals that I don't care about, something like that. So I think what was behind the question is, do you find space anywhere for these moral truths that are dictated by my own personal values? Well, I, I don't quite know what these moral truths that are independent of anybody's personal values could possibly be. I mean, I understand that I might be in the minority with respect to uh, some social issue where this large group thinks that they have moral truth and I think I have moral truth and we differ. I understand, I understand that perfectly. What I don't understand is the idea that somehow or other, um, independently of what anybody values, there are moral truths. I mean, it can't be the case that you could have a morality that is indifferent to the fundamental biological needs, that is fundamentally indifferent to the attachment and bonding that obtains between families and groups and so forth. And consequently, when a utilitarian says that we are supposed to treat indifferently everyone, that I am to care as much about an unseen Romanian, 10, ten unseen Romanian orphans as I am about my own child. And I say, oh yeah, like how's that gonna work? I mean, ultimately, Morality, like the law, has to be in the real world. There is no Plato's heaven. It ain't there. Or at least, I've never seen it. 
Um, we're going to take one um, from the live stream. So I think one, of our, might cover. one of our online viewers goes by the name of O'Neill Buchanan, and he is asking the following. How do we decide whether, in a particular instance, an animal is only caring for itself or caring directly or indirectly for another? Well, um, I mean, if I were John Searle at this point, I'd say, well, look and see. Uh, I think I think I will be John Searle. Look and see. Uh, so I wish I had this video tape. There's this wonderful video of um, well, actually there's two, but one involves um, a lab dog that has got a baby squirrel. The mother is up the tree. The mother flies down the tree, hurls herself at the dog's face. Um, and the dog drops the baby. The baby manages to get away, and the mother squirrel, you know, harasses the dog for a bit, and then gets away. But there's another one, uh, also on YouTube. Um, so uh, there was a, a National Geographic uh, photographer was in the far north, and he was interested in leopard seals, which, as good Canadians, you'll know, are quite dangerous. And so he was taking pictures of this leopard seal, who got quite interested in him and thought. Uh, well, saw the large maw of the camera and seemed to be puzzled by it and tried to get him, some of you have seen this, have tried to get him to uh, come to where the penguins were because it looked like she thought he was hungry, right? He's not this old. And of course, he didn't get the penguin, and so this went on for several days. He could go back into the water. Finally, she started killing penguins and bringing them to him, <laughs> leaving them, and he still wouldn't take them. So she went and killed another one, brought it right up to the camera, and kind of stuffed at it. <laughs> now, look and see, is what John Searle would say. Bless his heart. And um, there are lots of cases where it's going to be hard to say. So the fact that we might be able to say in the prototype cases, you know, that leopard seal thought she was doing the, you know, caring for something else, or those male chimpanzee dads who were raising uh, little infants not their own. I mean, they're expending energy. They don't have to do it. They could be lying in the sun, you know, exposing their bellies, uh, but they're not. <coughs> so, of course, there are lots of mixed cases where we don't know. What to say? Yeah. I'm going to keep going back and forth. Professor Churchill, a great Lucier theory, a great book. One thing I'm wondering about is uh, what T.H. Huxley was saying at Darwin, and of course, Richard Dawkins, the software team. Is a useful to think of niches. Uh, each species has a certain lifestyle. Right, right. Lions right. have certain or sharks, or right. more owners, and so on. The selfish genes would find it in their selfish interest to not look for traits that would that would be cooperation between individuals because it gives them a better chance to survive. Right, right. Put that, yeah, put that oh, yes, yeah, it yeah. gives them a better chance to survive. Sure, sure, sure. You, you know what I mean? But for example, of uh, uh, creatures, for example, that are pack animals would have more cooperation sure. than, than those kind of predators that are loners that sure, would, sure. would need the others just only for breeding or something like that. Yes. So, that, so the thing is, the possible right is to reconcile Dawkins, uh, self and genes, the idea of Huxley and, and Darwin would say as well. Oh, yeah, I mean, I think um, the quote that I had. I showed you from Richard Dawkins, I think suggested that he thought that the only way, I mean, there's lots of philosophers who did this too, that the only way you'll ever get moral behavior is, is by chain, you know, curbing and forcing man's immoral nature. I don't think that, I mean, I think it's clear from the behavior of social mammals that there's something wrong with that story. Precisely what is right is long and complicated, and we don't have all the answers. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that social behavior is every bit as biological as you know, swimming away if you're a leech and you're pinched. It's yeah. Sure. 
an issue that an issue that was uh, lying at the at the back of a lot of your talk, but that came out very very clearly in the last few slides at the end, uh, at least for me, is that for a lot of these moral categories and moral concepts, the prototype cases are cases that occur under great duress and under great pressure, uh, and when people are in pain, when people are in danger of death, you know, the, these you think are the really you know heroic moral cases. They're really truly moral cases. But it's um, it's going to be hard, I think, uh, to see um, how to make sense of of, of that idea. At least, uh, uh, if, if all you have is the reward system and habituation, because I'm, in these extreme cases, these people are presumably experiencing great pain, being overwhelmed by great stress, and it's it's not clear to me how the reward system and the ha and the habituation is going to you know, override that. Oh, I think that. Um there are certainly other parts um, to the story, the importance of social bonding. I mean, now we're thinking about males who, who fight with other males under you know, conditions that we might think of as warfare or, or intertribal conflict and so forth. Um, it's a complicated story, but uh, here, here's the part of the story that I think is usually untold. Um, but if you look, you'll find it. Um, for many men, going into back, and especially with this close camaraderie, is intensely pleasurable. Intensely pleasurable. Now, if you want to think about that, here's, a, here's one thing you can do to find out that where, where the battle is not so awful. Go on to the BBC or to the Guardian and find out about the soccer hooligans. And so here are these guys. I mean, you know, they could be your brother or your uncle. They're nice. And what do they do? They belong to these, these clubs. And their main fun in life is going to soccer games and beating the crap out of other people and getting beaten. They love it. And they will speak in terms about how much they love it and how exciting it is and how everything else in life pales by comparison. Um, now, this is also true of men who have fought in really terrible wars. So read Chris Hedges on his uh, many years in Vietnam. And he said, yes, it was terrible. But for me, it was like an intoxicant. It was like a drug. I loved it. And then there's General Patton, who said, war, war. Oh, God, I love it so. Now, well, he was a funny guy, but nevertheless. <laughs> so, but the important part of this story is that if you're going to be very sure about how awful it is to make a sacrifice, you want to have a closer look. And it isn't always uh, what you think. And often, as in, as in the case of intertribal conflict, people are hugely energized by it. It tends mostly to be men, but just so you don't think I'm, is, this is not completely a testosterone story. Um, what matters is the, different, is the balance between testosterone and cortisol with a dash of serotonin thrown in. Um, but I, I think it's a very complicated story. Now, of course, it is true that from time to time there are these really heroic things that are done by people. But I think it's the day-to-day -day decency, the day-to-day -day morality, the day-to-day -day politeness, and so forth. I consider that moral. Absolutely. I don't think you have to be you know, a martyr or a hero or a saint in order to live. I mean, this just sounds like Aristotle now. Uh, to live a good and decent and morally uplifting, uplifting life. for a non-philosopher. How about right here? Welcome home, Patricia, by the way. Thank you. Welcome to London. <laughs> My question is more aligned with the uh, neurobiology. Um, is morality uh, lateralized? Oh, uh, interesting. Distinctly to any particular hemisphere, maybe you can uh, talk about the uh, brain components, possibly, besides the endogenous reward system. Yeah, I mean, mostly what I have had to talk about is, is the subcortical structures 
um, that mediate reward, the subcortical structures that are important for attachment and bonding and, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> Of course, the frontal structures are always implicated in this sort of complicated and sophisticated uh, social behavior. And we know up to a point anyway that frontal structures are, are important for suppression of impulses and for the evaluation of a variety of kinds of options and, and, and the evaluation of consequences on each of those options and so forth. And we know that this is also done, done in animals. So, Obviously, control, the control structures, especially in orbital, frontal, and, and prefrontal, as they connect to subcortical structures, right? your cortex doesn't do it on its own, for sure. Um, that's obviously a very crucial part of the story. It's not a part of the story we know really well. So split brain patients, has, has there been any research on split brain patients? No, I mean, mostly, you know, the. I mean, there is some lateralization that Damasio reports in some of their PFC patients who have uh, damage to one side and not the other. But the, the most severe cases are the ones that have bilateral damage. But interestingly, in those cases, what they have found is that if the prefrontal damage is adult onset, right, so you lost your pre- PFC in a car smash up at 25, you don't see immoral behavior. You see stupid things, but you don't see people, you know, hauling off and, and slugging other people. However, if as a very young child you lost the PFC, you are quite apt. Numbers are small, but that's the finding, the finding so far. Now the other finding, of course, that's related to this, and you're talking about this on lunch, is the finding that Caspi and Moffat uh, have, but other people have now replicated, that people with an MAOA variant, uh, genetic variant. So MAOA codes for an enzyme that regulates reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine, which is mainly in the PFC. And so these people, if they have a genetic variant, so they actually have an excess amount of MAOA, and that they are abused as children they tend to be very violent um, and, and in a very self-destructive way. So whether they're mildly provoked or hugely provoked, they'll haul off and kill people. And um, so, so that's one case where you know, we know that there's something about this relationship, but we really don't know yet what, what it is that the abuse changes in those control structures or in the subcortical structures that gives rise to this phenotype. Um, so that remains a big issue. But I think, I mean, the, I was sort of surprised at this, but I think that in many ways aggression is, is because it's so much more ancient than sociality of the kind we see in mammals. Aggression is actually, I think, less well understood neurobiologically than social behavior. Are you, are you going to take one from here first? And then, um Online. If you don't have it right there, I can take another one here while you find it. Is this going to be another chicken entrails question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might. It might. <laughs> okay, why don't you uh, do Mel here and then we'll come back. Yeah. As a neuroscientist and as a biologist, it seems only sensible that the moral behavior of humans is founded on some uh, platform that's very ancient that involves the circuitry and the, and the hormones and the neuromodulators you mentioned. Um, setting aside religion, are there influential contemporary philosophical accounts that would deny that they are built on these biological principles? Well, Put it in a nutshell. Um, well, maybe elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there certainly are people who think that morality is dependent only on sort of a Kantian kind of reason, um, and that it emerges out of reason. 
which is really, really hard to square with what we see in the morality or the, the social behavior, the caring behavior of little kids. But anyway. Um, so there certainly is that that strain, and there is also, I think, a view that that. Um, the last bastion of, of philosophy is the normative, and that we should just get out of their territory. I think so. But the problem is that it's not just neuroscience that is making discoveries that impinge upon how we think about these issues. But also, I think psychology and molecular, you know, genetics and evolutionary biology. Now, there's many open questions. And, and as I said, I think there's, we had this discussion at lunch, too, that there are lots of places where science can give you some facts, but the social problem solving still has to take place. And that social problem solving often involves people getting together and trying to sort out, you know, it, and, and here I think John Dewey basically had it right, uh, that trying to figure out whether this social experiment will work or whether this social experiment will work. What I think sometimes is, and, and I'm not quite sure what philosophers to sort of pick this on, but I think there has been a kind of view of morality as as essentially platonic, as unique to humans, and as something that, in a certain sense, is independent of our nature and independent of our brains. That there are these moral facts or these moral truths, and if you have the right sort of reason, that you can perhaps capture those truths. And I'm, I'm not certain that that's wrong. I just haven't seen it be very productive so far. Whereas I think when I look at the sophistication that is in, say, the criminal law, um, where people really do try to make the law and make it fair and make it workable so that it's stable and people don't uh, take the law into their own hands and so forth. When I look at, at, at data like that, you know, I'm just terribly impressed with how it is that humans can come together and solve social problems that hugely matter to people's lives. And do it in, you know, in a way that's not magical, not platonic, very pragmatic, very, you know, let's, let's get this done, folks. Yeah. Sorry about that. There was a bit, actually a bit of discussion in the comments, and the question got lost. Oh, I'm sorry. That's OK. Uh, the asker says this is a little bit preemptive now. Says uh, Dr. Churchland, in your recent 3 a.m. magazine interview with Richard Marshall, you said that for contemporary philosophers, conceptual analysis per se was an end in itself, and you preferred to work in a naturalized direction. What would you say to a critical interlocutor who claimed that while the neuroscience is certainly interesting, it can't tell us anything about morality per se, following, you know, G. Moore style objections, and that what is good can't be an empirical question, but is a matter of analysis? Well, I mean, that, that's been my, my whole talk was designed to answer that, right? And it's designed to say, look, I'm not claiming that you can answer all questions about the moral thing to do. And I'm not sure that I can tell anybody else if they ask me, how should I live? I mean, God forbid that I should give you any advice. Um, and I don't think, by the way, that philosophers have been particularly very good on the advice front. I know. <laughs> um, with all due respect. Um, but, I mean, the whole story is a story that says we know a lot about the platform. Now, there are these other things. How to solve social problems such as um, should there be a military draft, or should you guys buy this new big boat for the Arctic, and so forth. And, and, and those are serious social problems. And I think that we more or less know how to go about tinkering with the institutions that are in place, institutions like the criminal justice system, to make them better. Often we don't know whether we're doing it right, and if we get it wrong, 
got to change and get it. But the idea that, that because G.E. Moore, sitting in his armchair, said, there is a naturalistic policy, darling, that I should back off. I mean, that's just silly. That's just nuts. Actually, this is related to the bunch of previous questions. So, um, your presentation gave us uh, an idea about the origin of morality in uh, humans and in animals in general. Uh, but it's just a description, the objection might be, right? So this is descriptive. What about the normative aspect? Is there a normative aspect that follows from this or can be inferred from this? Like, what would that be? I mean, what would be... Um, I mean, give me a normative aspect and then I'll know whether or not I should be able perhaps, to... Perhaps it's that domain of... Uh, non-empirical truths, truths of reason that may follow from the scientific research? I have no idea. I mean, I think that social problem solving is often really, really hard. And it's often hard because often people's passions are hugely engaged. And um, so depending on the nature of the issue, I mean, we just saw this in a recent election in the US where, you know, things got pretty grim there for a bit. Um, and, um, and I respect the fact that people can differ and that sometimes we can understand those differences as, as oh, just a, a different way of having a take on a problem. Um, at the end of the day, we have to live together because it's in our interest to live together. And so we find ways of solving these problems. Um, but the discussion of sort of morality in the abstract and normativity in the abstract, I'm not a good abstract person. I really want to take it down to something where I can get a grip on the thing. And so if you give me a particular problem, we can talk about it. Or if you ask me, you know, how is it possible that the reward system can be so important in, in building a really powerful conscience, we can talk about that. And I can you know, go about explaining. But, but morality in the abstract and normativity in the abstract, it's very troublesome for me because I just don't know what on earth to say. And I've never found anybody who's been very helpful to me. Uh, and you might think I have a look, but actually I have. <laughs> yeah, other than Hume. Thank you so much. I, I dare say I'm quite in love with your project. Um, but I'm on your side uh, in that the, the idea of normativity for me has no kind of what truth about it um, that's apart from us in any way. So assuming that we all, uh, we as in humans, all the same more or less substructure um, neurologically, uh, it's likely that the types of morals, meaning culturally, that human groups will have will probably be based on certain um, biological things that it we've worked on. Right. Yep. Um, so, uh, do you know of any research that's been done about uh, commonalities between uh, the kind of moral ideas between groups? So well, I looked at a few, uh, a few of the cultural historians. I mean, I think Paul Seabright is particularly good on this. Um, but, but, you know, as I mentioned with the Inuit, um, having truth-telling as, as uh, a practice not something they really discussed very much or anything like that. That was just assumed to be the way it was, and people modeled themselves after their elders and modeled themselves after their elders and so forth. Um, and there are certain other things that are really quite obvious. And I think, I mean, the analogy that I have here really is building of boats. I mean, just as there is no culture that has a, as a practice, as a moral practice, take your firstborn, boil it up, and feed it to the dogs. So there is no culture we know of that build, built boats by making great massive holes in the bottom. I mean, you know, it doesn't work that way. 
And so I think absolutely that many of the cultural norms that we see are, are reflective of people's needs, but also of historical accidents and, and the existing ecology and so forth. So, uh, but I would look at the cultural historians and the anthropologists who, who are really very good on this topic. So just to kind of save the normativity, so to speak, you're perfectly fine with talking about it in kind of a, a cultural relativistic sense. Absolutely. Sure, I mean, relative to a culture, we can talk about a norm as being accepted and defined within that culture. But then if somehow independent of brains, independent of all people, there's supposed to be normativity, you know, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. I mean, where else would it come from? I mean, you've got two options, really. It either comes from the brain, one way or another, or it, 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 it comes from religion. Well, I guess the third option is it's hiding in Plato's realm. Well, that really only leaves the brain. <laughs> you know, your, your last remark about the cultural relativity, I mean, we have a relatively small world now in the sense that yep. the interactions are all over the place. And so uh, there are even within uh, the, the sort of stuff you're talking about with the laws and people having to get together, that uh, can transcend any individual cultural relativity. So your story doesn't have to be merely culturally relative, and, and there's a lot of room between the things that we have to, have to do to live in a world where we're all interacting in ways that we may not have acted before, and uh, having it come down from Plato's heaven. I'm not sure I really understood your question. I mean, it is true that globalization is <coughs> You know, present and, and so forth, and that for certain kinds of things, um, we're having to find ways to accommodate other cultures that we don't particularly like, um, or that they, and so forth. Um, so I'm not sure where the transcending bit comes in. Well, if you have the, uh, to, to what I was worried about when you're talking about cultural relativity, was that you were that in a case where you have two cultures trying to interact, mm. that there could be no uh, fact of the matter about how things ought to go. Oh, I see. And, yeah, sure, and sure. Surely, the, even though it has to come from the interactions and stuff, that still affords resources for having uh, answers that go beyond just what each either culture on its own would say. Oh, sure, but then I think partly what's happening is that you, you have different cultures who are going to have to find a way to get along, but it's in their interest to find practices and to find ways of managing so that the overall result is one of stability. Um, and so that's always a constraint. I mean, you might think of that as being long-term self-interest, if you like. And that's, in a way, I, I think the thrust of, of um, Steve Pinker's new book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, where uh, the argument is that, that sometimes um, war can be such that uh, all of the possible participants recognize that they can't possibly achieve anything by doing this, and that there's better ways, better ways of managing, and so they don't. Now, this isn't to say, of course, that there aren't nasty wars going on elsewhere, but I mean, his general point, I think, is quite interesting. Um, so, of course, when I talk about problem solving, I certainly don't mean to exclude that, that people have to take into account their own interest and the interest of their group, but also, you know, how are we going to get on with these guys? I mean, what will be a stable situation here? 
Um, but having said that, of course, I recognize that often within groups there's, uh, you know, special kinds of difficulties, you know, the megalomaniac leader or the, you know, and so forth. Um, and, and, and that, that over time um, leads to all kinds of complications. So we have to hope that Steve Pinker is right. Uh, but I'm not, you know, entirely convinced um, that, that he is. So, you know, I mean, in, in sort of dumping on Plato's heaven, I don't mean that I don't think that these social issues are not really serious. I think they're absolutely deadly serious. Um, and it matters enormously how we confront them and, and, and come together to solve them. And if we're stupid about it, we'll pay the price. Thank you. So I'm curious if you, there's any room in your uh, view for something like uh, the concept of moral progress. Ah, yes. So, because I'd like to think that, yes. say, in political philosophy, the concept of equality has gained a certain currency, and we are liable to say things like, a world in which women are equal is better, or a society in which sure. women are treated equally is better than one which is not, which introduces that nasty normativity that you don't want to talk about. So. You know, if you want to make those kinds of comparisons, how are we going to ground it given in your general sort of Well, I mean, there, I'm not the best person to ask that uh, question. I mean, Steve Pinker is a better person to ask, uh, ask that of. And I think part of the answer is that you can evaluate this institution at, at an earlier time with uh, a change in that institution at a later time by seeing the degree to which it provides for stability and prosperity, the degree to which people accept it, the degree to which well-being is. Uh, and these are, are not things that are unmeasurable. I mean, they're, and, and so I, I don't think normativity in some platonic sense gets into the picture. I think that what we do is, yeah, I, I, I think what we do is evaluate, you know, why it why it actually works up better. So that one hears, for example, vis-a-vis -vis education of women in Africa, I mean, the argument is, look, you know, it's a really good idea, not just because it's nice for them, but because it correlates so tightly with increase in prosperity and increase in health. And uh, so this is now an argument that's used. Now, some philosophers don't like it because they think that it should be a purely moral. Uh, argument that it's just because it's right, not because it it promotes stability and prosperity and well-being, but only insofar as it's right is it a, a moral argument. And I'm not that pure. Question in the back. Your, your work is, is motivated from uh, a biological foundation, a, a caring for self that moves on to can and kit, like you, like you mentioned. Um, uh, I'm wondering, and of course, you know, as you get further away from the self, there's this problem of distance. It's harder and right. harder for me to have a certain biochemical response that I can right. care for people that are further and further away from me. Um, I'm wondering if there's room for, given our technological advances, uh, social media, the internet, um, feasibility to travel, um, if we can expand that, that sphere of empathy to uh, an ability to um, interact at that level to make me care about a greater number of people, such that there's not necessarily going to always need to be um, an other or someone who mm -hmm. I, I don't care about, or are we necessarily going to be limited by um, scarcity of resources or some need to define myself yeah. against something external? Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. I, I don't really know how to answer it. I mean, we certainly know, I and mean, the social psychologists I think have been quite clear about this, that, that there is sort of declining degrees of caring um, as you move away from kith and kin. But that even, even then, you know, there are still circumstances that will provoke people um, to help. Um, but probably the bulk of it is 
the bulk of your caring and your ministrations and so forth are going to be to the people that you know. You know, there is, Robin Dunbar has this famous number, the, the Dunbar number, 150, which is about the maximum number of people you can know well enough to care about. And so, yes, it's true that, you know, if you show me certain really horrific pictures, I'll probably pull out a 20 and give you some money. Um, but, but, the Robin, but the Dunbar number, as people who look at it again and again in a variety of kinds of circumstances, does suggest that by and large, for most conditions where people you know, are, need to make a sacrifice and need to uh, put themselves out, incur a cost, that it's within the 150. Um, and that's not, I think, because we're bad, but really because that's about as much as we can handle. Well, I mean, you might be able to handle 200, and maybe I can only handle 40, but I mean, you know, it's, it's an average. Right. Yeah. Um, I just have a question about uh, the word morality um, that you're using. There's a, a lot of baggage with the word. Um, mm -hmm. Wouldn't it just be easier to just say social problem solving that instead of morality where you get into a lot of existential philosophical debates about how do, you, how do each different person define morality? Like you, obviously your definition is a lot different than uh, someone else's. So can't you just I, I understand there is a lot of, I guess morality is a more sexy word than social problem solving, but if you just said uh, you are talking about social problem solving, wouldn't that solve a lot of problems, the existential debate that you're having? Well, I think it really, I really do want to address the question where moral values come from. That's, really, that's the question. And I don't mean anything significantly different from, uh, by morality than, by and large, what people need. And uh, yes, it can be defined um, in a proprietary way by someone who says it's not a genuine moral act unless it's done um, purely and only because it's right, for example. Uh, but that is a proprietary definition. That's not what most people so I'm talking about moral behavior as, you know, what we're generally talk about as moral behavior. What Nelson Mandela did, for example. I mean, isn't that a, that's a, a, an instance of, a, of a, an action that I think we could all agree is right there in the, in the prototypes. And so um, I, I prefer not to shy away from it and, and say this isn't really about morality and hope that the philosophers will quit beating up on me. Uh, you know, it is what it is. This is a story about the origin of moral values. And it's a story that tells us about the mammalian brain and the importance of cortex. And it doesn't say that, that uh, it's all going to be answered by science. I don't for a moment believe that. I think that um, people in the law courts have got a lot to say about many of these issues, and as, as do policy people and others. So um, it, it, that's what it is. Uh, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It won't be the first time. Yeah, we're near time, so maybe I'll take one more question and then I'll get I'd like to ask you, or suggest, that there might be two types of evolution here. One is a biological, ah. and then the other is where we're cultural. Cultural, the cultural work, yeah. right, as a, where the culture comes in, it takes on a life of its own. Sure. And it comes with Karl Popper called a, a world free object. And that's, and that's where we get our Plato's and our ideal forms and, and our, our people that talk about utilitarianism versus other things, you know? Sure. Just because that's right for me. Yeah, no, certainly you want to distinguish biological evolution from cultural evolution, absolutely. And so when people uh, raise issues about moral progress, um, they're talking about cultural evolution, 
absolutely not, not biological evolution. Yeah. I mean, the current sort of best story out of genetics is that apart from changes in um, digestion and skin color and a few other minor things, there probably haven't been any genetic changes that have had an impact on cognition for a quarter of a million years in humans. Um, so when Chomsky says that our genes for language came in 40,000 years ago, you might want to raise a question. Um, I'd like uh, Andrew Peterson to come up now. He's one of our graduate students and a member of the um, uh, Brotman Institute to thank our speaker. Oh, how nice. Andrew Peterson, um, and I do have the esteemed pleasure of being able to thank Dr. Churchland today. Uh, Dr. Churchland, your warmth to us today, your interest in all of our questions and your attentiveness is so meaningful to us. And I say this, of course, by being a student who is fencing between neuroscience and philosophy. Right? So it's incredibly meaningful to me. So that being said, we have a tradition here at the Rotman Institute to give our very important people, our VIPs, uh, a special gift. It's not going to be a raw chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no <interest>. <laughs> <laughs> it, It's the two tools that are essential to being a philosopher. The first tool, <laughs> the first tool is a bag for your books. Ah, uh, yay! <laughs> and the second Ooh, tool, that's nice. and the second tool is a cup for your coffee. Although this yes. is a thermos. So, oh, lovely. Thank you. So thank you very much, Dr. Trickle. Wonderful. Thank you.